detail is there in the, in the Java API, and it just takes two simple details, which is the IP address, so we're just going to run off local host today. And it responds with the found object name that I put in my RMI service called OWASP NYC. So we're going to take a note of that because that's our first detail that we needed on an attacker's shopping list. So the bound name is OWASP NYC. So that was straightforward enough. Step one is very simple. Step two, determining the stub name. So my skeleton is sitting there now ready to take invocations on my RMI service, but we need the correct corresponding stub name in order to match the invocations. So we're now going to quickly retrieve the stub name. Again, it's a simple uh, process with the tools. So this tool is just called RMI Spy Stub Name. And you're going to see as we go through the steps, the next step requires a detail from the previous step. So the parameters which need passing in here are the IP address again of the service, the port number, and then the bound object name which we retrieved in step one. And that's going to now tell us these, what I need to call my stub name when I'm trying to build my custom kind of a client side. As we saw in the architecture, there's several layers, and we're trying to implement that stub layer. We don't want the, the developer to pass it out. We found a RMI service wants to attack, so we need the correct stub name, and RMI spy stub name is going to tell you what the server expects, what the corresponding stub should be for communication with the skeleton. Again, we'll store that in our shopping list. We don't need that. Okay. And we were here. Yeah. Okay, so we've already completed step one and two of an RMI assessment. Now it becomes a little more complicated. We need to dig out method hashes. Method hashes are used for 1.2, and today we're going to dig out what's called an interface hash for 1.1, as the implementation changed slightly as Sun developed 1.1 and 1.2. So we're going to run a brute force attack against the server to determine the actual 64-bit key, which is going to allow us to invocate on the server. Now, when you're communicating with, from the client to the server, this key is constantly sent over, so it knows, what, um, it knows that you're kind of an authorized client, but we're going to retrieve that. And this detail is actually stored in the lower layer of the RMI architecture. So I'm going to actually slightly cheat today because if we just brute force a whole 64-bit range, you guys aren't going home for a long time. So we're going to run RMI spy method hash. And again, this takes a bit more detail that we retrieved from the earlier steps. And there's also a few um, slight code modifications we have to make for this tool. See, so RMI spy method hash is going to attempt to make invocations on the server. Now I've retrieved the stub name, and I'm going to need this for the RMI spy method hash tool. And this is a uh, step three. So this is a kind of template that I've written. You don't need to worry about too much about the implementation. Uh, you just need to make a quick code change based on the detail you've retrieved. Um, the stub name we retrieved earlier in step two was called uh, sample service stub. So we're just going to update the template. Just to fit in with the Java conventions. And then we have this kind of fake stub that I've implemented. And this is going to allow us to start communicating with the RMI service. So I've made a quick code change there to the class, just so it fits in with the correct stub name that the server expects. So we're going to recompile that now and use our, no, because I haven't renamed the stub. So you also need to rename the stub name to the, um, to the detail that we retrieved in step two, because obviously that's going to fit in with the Java conventions. Your class name and your file name must be the same. So we're going to recompile this now. And now we're ready to run RMI spy method hash. 
So we can see the details it takes. It's looking for where the actual RMI service is hosted and the object name, which we retrieved in step one. And then RMI spy method hash will take a hash as a final argument and it's going to increment the hashes and try and brute force about what hash exists on a server side. And as I said, we're just looking at 1.1 today. So once we retrieved one 64-bit hash, we essentially can start taking control of the server. It's going to allow us to interact with the business logic layer. We can start kind of doing whatever we feel like. So we're going to start with, as I said, I'm going to kind of cheat. I know what the hash is because I developed the RMI service. And we're going to brute force, say, 400 keys. There you go, RMI spy method hash is now attempting all the hashes um, start at the starting point that I gave it. We've tried 401 hashes, and it's now identified the correct hash on the server side as well, whatever the number is. <laughs> and again, we're going to keep tabs on what this interface hash is. I'm going to build up these details in the attacker's shopping list. So we know the bound name, we know the stub name, and we now know the interface hash, which is probably one of the hardest details to retrieve, but I'm going to show you later on. There's going to be new additions to RMI Spy, and there's going to be many ways to help you retrieve this key. Okay, so we now have the key. I'm going to show you that as we've been running the RMI uh, server, you can see that I, I actually had many... Uh, kind of debug messages to go out on, on the RMI server. You're going to see them kind of happening when we start invocating. But you can see so far we've profiled a lot of details about the server, and there's not been kind of any messages, anything printed out. So even as a developer, if you kind of had some local messages to be displayed, you're not going to see any of them yet until an actual attacker has developed a successful client, and you're going to start seeing messages appearing as we're developing our own client. So this brings us on to determining the method prototypes. So the, the, we've got the first three details, but we need to actually know what's actually hosted on the server. The same concept as the, um, a web service. What's the method? What values does it take? What's the parameters? What's the return type? So we're going to use a, another tool in the suite. And this one is called, original name again, RMI Spy Method Prototype. And you guys can just about see that, okay? And again, just same as the other tools. It takes a uh, it takes an IP address for the service. It's looking for a uh, the bound object name, and also um, there's a new um, kind of detail we need to pass to this tool, which is going to kind of make more sense to you how the actual invocations of RMI works. You see that one of the arguments is a method number. Now, when you host your methods on an RMI service, they start at kind of zero, and if you have, um, they go up sequentially. So your second method is one, your second method's two. So what's actually happening on the wire of an RMI service is that the client sends over the 64-bit key, and then it's going to send a corresponding method number as well. So the 64-bit key is always static. So if you want to execute method uh, one on the server, you're going to pass in zero. Execute method two, we're going to pass in one. And we're going to use this to start profiling all the different methods that exist on the server. So logically, we're going to start at method zero. What's the first method that's actually bound on this OWASP NYC object? And we're going to need to pass the interface hash in to begin a successful 